one of my favorite quotes that is recent to me, it's been around for a while, is this one from Phil Jackson, who's considered to be probably one of the best coaches, not only in the NBA, but of all time. And he shares this. The one thing I've learned as a coach is that you, can, you can't force your will on people. If you want them to act differently, you need to inspire them to change themselves. I love this quote because I think it has so many applications to how we view leadership, how we view the classroom. So for example, do we get kids to want to learn because they see the purpose and the meaning or do kids learn because we use a carrot and stick method? It's all about the grades that they get. There are punishments if they don't get something done. And so I think there's so many applications to this in education, but also this is a quote that resonated with me when I was talking to my guest today, Mike Kleba. And Mike actually wrote a book with Dr. Ryan O'Hara called Otherful, How to Change the World and Your School Through Other People. And it's really about how we actually help people to help people find their own way, to make their decisions, to find purpose in the work that they do. Mike is full of energy. He's such a positive person. When I say positive, he's always looking at solutions. We had a great conversation about how we both struggle, um, you know, with dark things in our lives, but it's not that we're uh, negative or pessimistic or overly optimistic. It's that we're both focused on finding solutions because that's ultimately how you not only help others, but you can help yourself. It's a wonderful conversation. He is full of energy. Uh, I really love talking to him. I know you're going to love this podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Coast, another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed today to have Mike Kleba. Mike is actually... Uh, an educator in North Shore in the New, in New York State, North Shore people. Just a little shout out if you miss the other podcast. Uh, absolutely wonderful people. Uh, how do you say? And is it Chris Zublo, Zublu? How do you Zub, say Zublionis. Zublionis. Just Zublionis. think. Just think this. The in the middle is the word lion. Zublionis. Leonis. That's yeah, it, he's man. Such a good guy. Such a good guy. He's and, amazing. Uh, he's yeah, amazing. And, Lovely and I've been able to connect with your staff, but. Mike, if you know anything about Mike, if you have had a chance to listen to our three questions podcast, Mike is, uh, has such an infectious personality just talking to you. I'm like, I want my kid to be in your class. Like I, that, that's uh, like, that's legit the best compliment I can give any educator in the world. That's how it feels, so, man. Thank you for that. Right? I appreciate it. Yeah. So I, I hope you are like this in the classroom. I hope you're not like a dud all, after. All the right? time, man. Right? All the time. So, hey, listen, sometimes I'm a dud, right. but uh, wow. most, of the, most of the time it's just like this. It's all right. Yeah, this we is what can, it is. You know, can't knock it out of the park every day, right? But <laughs> then that's the reality. But Mike, if you can just, uh, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Mike and Dr. Ryan O'Hara's book, Other Full, How to Change the World and Your School Through Other People. Mm. Uh, you can check it out in the link down below but mike thanks so, so much for being on the podcast if you could just tell everyone a little bit about who you are what you do today and how you got there it's great to be here with you george um you know i i don't think there was any other gig that i wanted to do more than than work in education you know like so many people i talk to uh you know i i, I pull a, a a chorus move and i ask people you know was your favorite teacher because Here's right. what I know. You know, not everybody's got, uh, you know, a, a favorite dentist or <laughs> or a favorite auto mechanic or right. not, every, not everybody's got a fa even a favorite neighbor. Right. But everybody's got a favorite teacher. You can't find I mean, you know, right. you, you will find yourself in a situation where you're like, I don't know what to talk about. I'm at a party. I'm at a bar. I was forced to do this thing with my spouse. I have to show up. <laughs> and honestly, if you're stuck, here's right. the question. Yo, did, who's a favorite teacher of yours? I'm just wondering. Yeah. I swear it will always turn into a cool conversation. And and so, you know, I, I got an education from jump. I started when I was 22. You know, I, I in fact, my mom sent in an application to a school for me and they called me up. <laughs> I was awesome. living on I, honestly, I was living on Martha's Vineyard. I had long blonde hair. I was hanging out with a bunch of people. I was living in a house of 14 people. It was a bunch of Irish folks and and like waiters and a sous chef. It was crazy. It was, it was a, crazy a reality show, I remember. Uh, dude, I'm not kidding. It was crazy. Yeah, I was and, like it, right? And my mom this Jersey called me. Shore? Were you in Jersey Shore? Is that your <laughs> That was Martha's Vineyard Shore. And, uh, and, and my, my mom called the house phone. Like, you know, somebody's like, 
Mike, it's, I think it's your mom on the phone. And, and I go to the phone and, and, and it's, she's like, listen, I sent in an application for you. They're going to be calling you in an hour. I, I was probably hung over. Like, you know, I mean, I was a kid, right? I'm mean, like, you know, I was over age, everybody, by the way, for any of my right. students. 22. 22. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and anyway, so then I get on a bus. I'm not getting from, from Massachusetts, right? I take the ferry then I get on a bus and I go to this interview. I show up. They've hired me. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, when when I first started teaching, I remember I remember the first week in the classroom. It reminded me of student teaching. Like uh, right. last day of student teaching, I freaking cried the whole ride home, man. I'm like I got like cranked up. I'm like I need counting crows right now. I'm taking us to the 90s, and I'm like I need to be sad and think about my last day of school. When I ended student teaching, I was so sad, man. Back in the classroom, I was like right. this is where I, this is where I need to be. So since then, I've been teaching. I've almost straight through. I stepped out of the classroom for for a year to work at an ed tech company and and to get kind of involved in ed tech i've kind of been pretty deep involved in it since then uh i'm now uh leading the new york ed tech meetup with a couple of really beautiful people jessica millstone and sharia huda and we got this great ed tech community in new york city that's like massive nine thousand members it's really wow. really great and uh and and i'm and i'm you know my passion if if i'm going to tell you what it is it's uh I love people who uh, want to really attend to the real challenges of education, aren't afraid to look at how challenging it is, aren't afraid to call a spade a spade, right. aren't afraid to call out things that aren't working, and also are here because they love it. They're also here because they're like, yo, man, we could change the world up in this. Education is the silver bullet, everybody. You can't say it too much. It is the most important right. apparatus in our culture. So, I mean, that's my thing, man. Well, that it. actually, you know, when my my parents, you know, my parents were both immigrants to Canada. I've talked about them a million times. And they saw education, just like you said. That was the way to a better life, right? And they mm -hmm. limited in education, grade two, grade six, between my mom and my dad. And that's something where I've already been passionate about. The thing that you talked about calling a spade a spade, I've always tried to do that, but I try to do it through humor first because I think a lot of times if you call a spade a spade too quick, then you lose people because I feel that they're kind of, you know, it's it's also a very hard job, right? Like mm. there's, no, there's no doubt about it. All the inspiring things that teachers do, it's, it's emotionally exhausting. And you, you talk about how basically you have this passion for it. Mm. But, but like how you know and you felt this is something to do but a lot of people right now have nothing right they got they're they're exhausted we were talking about this on other other podcasts it's like a blur right mm -hmm. it's just like the the best the best analogy that you know i've talked about this is you know like when you're through the whole week and you get to friday and like when we were younger you were just like i like you partied on friday but then when you became a teacher it's like if you were up till nine that was insane right Seriously. like and you, it was like, it's just a totally different tired on Friday. Falling asleep now, on the sofa. Yeah. Totally. totally. Chips, yeah. chips, <laughs> chip, <laughs> chip crumbles all over my body. Right. Exactly. To totally, man. But now it feels like, you know, from people I talk to, it's that teacher tired Friday every mm -hmm. single day times 10. Like, it's just like, just exhausting. Right. So like, like what advice and, and maybe you don't have any, right. And that's a reality too. And that's okay. But like, like if you're talking, cause people I think are they're losing their passion for it in many ways and and understandably so right if you're just overwhelmed 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 so like how do you keep that light going right now when things are really really tough you know i think a lot about the 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 power we get from recognizing that um we're capable of a lot more than we think we can you know yeah. uh you know i was just checking out your um uh, you know, this video that you put up of like this radical physical transformation you just went through. Right. And, and it's awesome, by the way, man, like congratulations. And when did you look at that? It, just uh, now, like, just no, 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 no. I was actually, oh, yeah. I was talking to, I was talking to Ryan, uh, you know, right. uh, yesterday or something like that. And he's like, yo man, have you seen this? Have you seen like Koros's like, like transformation video? Oh, I'm crazy. like, no. And then we looked at it, Ryan, Ryan O'Hara and I, my, my co-writer, right. he and I, we talk every morning. So we watch a video and he's like, he'd already watched it a couple of times. Um, it's freaking awesome. Now, the reason why I'm shouting that out, it, you know, it's not just to show love your way, although I'm happy to show love your way because I'm so delighted to be here, but it's because, <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Go let's, go. let's go. Let's go. Let's <laughs> um, go. It's like I'm right now. I feel like I'm driving through Washington Heights here in New York city. I think it's beautiful. Um, uh, you know, what, it, what's powerful is that we have a lot more capacity than we think we do. Mm. And I don't mean we're too weak to see it. 
life is hard, baby. Life is really, really right. challenging. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a teacher who's been in the game for 15 years and you're struggling, it's really hard, or you're an 11 year old who's really trying to like struggle right. with executive functioning, but you couldn't spell executive functioning and you have no idea even what that is. Right. Or you're somebody who's dealing with, you know, hard physical challenges, you know, uh, limitations to your body, right. your family's in hard straits, whatever it is. I never want to blame anybody for being in a tough spot, but I deeply believe that one of the most important powers we have is the ability to reframe what we're going mm-hmm. through and say, you know what, there are some things I can do. And, you know, so the light I have, and, you know, and, and I try to share with people because like you, I think maybe this is a projection. I don't know if it is George, but like when people call me out for being kind or positive, I'm like, listen, man, I got plenty of darkness. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not here. I'm not here to pretend that everything's, as you said, right. sunshine and rainbows in our right. other podcast. What I'm trying to say here is there's sunshine and rainbows. There's also rainstorms and earthquakes, but you know what? Don't forget that there is actually sunshine, man. And there are actual rainbows right. and, and, right. and you can also make that sunshine and be those rainbows. And, and I don't just mean for other people, for yourself. So, I mean, the, the message I have for people is I hear where you are. I respect it. And, you know, if you're tapping out or if you need to dip, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to judge you. But I also want to say, as I said at the top of this episode, um, you are in one of the most powerful positions in the history of the world as a teacher. Right. Right. No, you might not be well known. There's nobody walking around with like, you know, your name on the back of their jersey. There's not a poster of you, although there should be probably a poster right. of you holding a piece of chalk in somebody's room. But you are literally going to be talked about forever mm-hmm. by hundreds, if not thousands of people. And dude, that's just like that's something and feel that, you know, and and think mm-hmm. about what you can do with it. Yeah. You know, when you're when you're talking about this, you know, the 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 big catchphrase of toxic positivity and all that stuff. And you probably, mm. I'm sure you've heard that quite a bit. Right. Uh, totally. And I, you know, I've been like, Oh, you're just like, I, I, I don't think I'm an overly positive person to be honest with you. I'm a very solution focused person. Like, mm. I'm like hey, this sucks. I got, but I got to figure it out. Right. And I don't swear usually, but yeah, I actually, that was my first swear. First swear. <laughs> let's go some of that. <laughs> so anyways yeah like i i um i i i i know this is and i i think you said something that really connected with me if i don't try to figure out a solution if i don't try to find a way forward the the dark for me will get worse and yeah. i'll get and i can get in a really bad hole and like you know i've dealt with depression for years and stuff like that too and i think a lot of times i understand why people are like hey like you know, your positivity is not helping this stuff. Okay. Like then mute me, do whatever, but this is what I need to get through right now. This is what I need to kind of get through some of the stuff that I'm going through in that space. Mm-hmm. And, it, and like, uh, there's a really great quote from Mark and angel and I've shared it a million times. It's not like, and it's something paraphrased along the lines of like, it's not about ignoring the negative. It's about finding solutions. And mm-hmm. I think that's me is something I've really tried to embrace is that a lot of times when you're pushing yourself to do something, whether it's, you know, in the classroom, it's, you know, leadership, it's, you know, personal life, that things don't work out the way that you do. And, and I actually, like, I was just talking, I just, I wrote a couple of blogs right before I got to, and I think that the, the notion of like, um, failure being temporary thing that is totally decided upon people because it's temporary. If you decide that, right. Yeah. If you decide I'm going to get back up that you make people make it finite, right. If you decide not to try anymore or not to do that. And so I appreciate that because I think a lot of times there is this uh, perception that people are like very Pollyanna and they just see the world as like really good when it's not. It's like, no, like I I know there's crappy stuff. I know there's, you know, things that people are dealing with. And so I'm going to do everything I can to find a solution because if I don't, you do not want me in a bad place. Like you don't want me getting in that too. And like I've very been been very cognizant in my teaching career to know spaces not to go, right? Because... Yep it will it will actually again it will uh, if it affects me it affects my kids right like i'm very cognizant of how i spend my time on social media because some someone being nasty with me doesn't affect me only it affects Mm -hmm. me being grumpy with my my family grumpy with my kids you know and so it's like okay you know i'm not doing that right and there's there's better ways i can be spending my time that's the that's the other full piece for us i mean we are all connected the thing about other full it's not it's not being selfless I mean, yeah. in fact, that's where the title came from. It's like being selfless doesn't work. 
You know, you will burn out. You know, we have this mythology in our culture that great teachers and great leaders, you know, they're, they're basically martyrs fundamentally. And if they're not martyrs, right, if they take care of themselves and they're being selfish. Right. And, and, you know, Ryan and I, we were really spending a lot of time on this because like you, we don't want this Pollyanna thing. I have to be honest with you, George, personally, I don't trust you if you don't have darkness. I don't trust right. you if right. you don't mess up, if you don't think that things yeah. can go sideways and go terrible. Like there's a part of me, if you're always up, if you're always positive, I'm like, you know what? You're either not telling me the truth or you don't get what's actually happening here. Either yeah. way, I'm not yeah. down. You know, so I'm with you. And and we were really cognizant of that because we wanted to write a book that was you know, uh, uh, inventive and inspirational, but we also wanted it to be practical and we wanted people to believe in it. So through the book, you know, we've got these chapters that are very practical ways. They're short. They're like two, three pages long. We're like, you know, we want to do things that people could read in a PD. People could read together. They can literally read in, you know, five, six minutes of a, uh, like of a meeting and then talk about it. And then at the end of each one, we have a disclaimer and the disclaimer in at the end of every chapter, man, you're going to love this when you check it out. The disclaimer at the end of every chapter is basically like, sometimes this doesn't work. You know, we got a chapter right. on forgiveness. I'm a big fan of forgiveness. I think that people have to mess up. We are in a cultural movement now where if you make a certain type of mistake, you're right. gone, right? I think that's terrible. You know, people make mistakes. That's what makes us human. That's what makes us beautiful. Right. You know, our flaws are what teach us. They also make us profoundly approachable because nobody's perfect. So at right. the end of the forgiveness thing, it's like forgive people, make room for people. And then the disclaimer is, Except some people, you can't forgive them because they do something terrible. And you know what? Right. Let it go. <laughs> you can't forgive them. Right. Cut them out and move on. It should be very few people, but have them. And like, if yeah. you don't cut them out, you're hurting yourself. You might be hurting your school. And so, you know, I I'm totally down with you on all of that, man. We, we have to somehow thread this needle of not being too positive, but still being able to be positive. You can be critical and positive at the same time. I yep. believe it. Yeah. And like, I actually, I have a tweet that I, I posted years ago and I actually saved it. And it's like, there's a difference between uh, being critical of ideas and being critical of people. And I think a lot of times the thing that we were talking about before we got on the podcast is I can have different ideas than you, but I, if I, as long as I feel that you are, we're both focused on helping kids, helping our colleagues, then, then, you know, then our ideas can be different. Right. And I think a lot of that, um, is kind of like saying like, oh, your intent is wrong. It's not even about the pro they, it's just assuming the intent. Right. And, and that, that connection. And I think that for me is something that's one of the reasons when I would talk to, like, we'd get in some like really, you know, tough conversations with teachers, uh, tough conversations with parents sometimes. And like, I'd have like a tough conversation with parent and I would like kind of do this recentering thing. And I'd say like, Hey, you and I are here both to do what's best for your kid. Correct. And I would make it a question, not a statement, but a question, because I need them to say yes. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like, I need them to say something back. So it's kind of like centering, like, why are we here in the first place, right? And I think when we kind of lose that purpose of why we're, we're actually there to serve people, to help our kids, to do this, that's when we start getting into these really bad spaces. That's when we start seeing conflict that's, it's not, I'm not saying conflict's bad. But there is conflict that's actually not needed in some spaces, right? Yeah, and it's unproductive. I think it's yeah. spot on. In fact, something that you just said uh, really not only resonates with me, but it reminds me of something that, you know, Ryan, my co-writer, Ryan O'Hara, was working on when he did his study, when he did his dissertation. His whole piece uh, that he wanted to dig into was like, what really is reflective practice? And anybody who studied to be a leader, you've been a leader for a long time. Anybody who's listening right now, you know, we talk about Donald Schoen. We talk about reflective practitioners. We talk right. about reflective practice. So important, right? Well, Ryan wanted to dig into something that is going to be so up your alley, George. It's like, where is that space between where we're reflective or we're pretending to be reflective? And hardly right. anybody ever wants to talk about this, right? We just do the, we talk about reflection like it's something we all understand. And this is the thing that you said that reminded me of this. You know, Ryan entered it and said, like, let me just talk to people about what they think reflective practice is. And here's what he found, man, that the people that he talked to in his study what they thought was reflective practice meant that that person I was talking to thought like I did. They agreed with me and thought right. in the same way I did. So that meant they were reflective. And if you right. didn't think like I did, it means you're not reflective enough. 
And he literally found this in his study. I mean, his dissertation was predicated on it. And I think that that speaks exactly what you're talking to. It's like, we can't have disagreements because we misunderstand what a disagreement is. A disagreement is like, I see it differently than you, man. And yeah, sometimes that conflict needs to be like, we're going to end this conversation. But sometimes a lot of times more frequently than not, it means, you know what? I probably have something to learn from you. And I need to be open to that and be present to it, especially when I'm a leader, especially when I'm running a school. Right. I mean, you know, I got to keep the trains running, man. I can't shut this place down because we got a conflict. I can't stop everything because we have a problem. I need to actually be the bomb is what we say. Well, I need to make this OK. I need to lower the temperature. I need to right. like keep everybody cool. And so that we can actually have conflict that's productive. That's the George Koros move. Be practical, find a solution and move on instead of be like, but I'm still mad at that person. It's like, yo, man, I'm mad too. Right. Find a way to deal with it. Go for a run, lift some weights, right. uh, go out to eat, and then come back. You know, strap those cleats on and let's get to work. Well, so the there's a term that I used, and I don't know if it's I don't honestly know if it's mine or it came. Like, you know, like when you write so much, you're like, what did I come up with? Right? What <laughs> totally? You know what I mean? All my gr- all my best ideas were stolen by the ancients. <laughs> like, right, right. So I talk about um, a 365 degree view of an idea. Right. There's no way that's mine. So the, the, when I blog and it's actually, I love that you said it about Ryan might be yours. I don't know. Is when, when I blog about any idea, I always think what will be the pushback to this idea? What Mm. will be, what will be the issue? And then, and maybe it's because I don't like, I try to like, I don't, I don't mind conflict, but I try to avoid it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not against it. I actually like to get in conversations with people I trust to like, you know, kind of like stir the pot a little bit. Yeah. Sharpen but, irons, man. Right. And totally. I, I do like that, but I also don't want it because I, I was not empathetic or I didn't think of a different perspective. Right. And so I, there's a lot of times people that read my blog, I'll say like, Hey, I'll talk about an idea. And then I'll say, what I'm not saying is, and then I'll actually address what I think is going to do this. And I, there's, there's a reason I do this because I would rather me say it than somebody say it in the comments. Do you know what I mean? It's like addressing it before. And, and do I always hit every counter argument? Absolutely not. Right. But the reflective piece is like, Hey, what am I missing in this space? Like, what am I not talking about? What, what's going to be the hole in this argument and actually thinking about that. And, um, there's a, there's a great quote from Clive. I think it's Clive Thompson. There's like, there's like a Clive who, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure it's Clive. There's like a, who's the Clive that does movies. You know who I'm talking about. Um, uh, uh, Clive Owens, Clive. Yeah, me, or, yeah, yeah. So it's not. It's, I always get the two mixed up. One like does horror movies, and one writes books on the internet. I can't remember which one. Clive was. Owen. That's it. Clive I'm Owen. Sure so Clive Thompson, he said, uh, it was actually inspired by this quote. He said, "Anyone can win an argument inside their head, but when they have to face an audience, you have to be truly convincing." Mm. And so one of the things that's really beautiful about having a blog, a podcast is it makes you think more because you're putting your ideas out into the world where people can push back, where they can challenge. But when you're like, oh, I'm just, you know, like I, I like self-reflect, which mm. is like, nah, I don't really, nah, I'm just saying that. So you don't <laughs> push me on this. I think, I think that has really like, it's, it's funny because I always talk about like, you know, innovation and like moving education forward. And I think the best way that I've actually done that is by reflection is by looking back. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. It's the superpower, right. man. The ability yeah. to look at yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, hey, tell us, tell, tell, tell everyone about, I, I'm curious, like, I want to dig into your book, but I actually want to talk about the process with you. Obviously, you and uh, Dr. Ryan O'Hara have a pretty good uh, relationship. You talk, I'm actually, whatever. You don't text me every morning, but whatever. That's fine. I, I mean, I, I, I'm going to text you tomorrow morning. I'm going to do it, dude. Not a, you're in Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> you're like, please wait yeah, until like the morning. Right you're now. like, unless I'm pe- unless I'm peeing in the middle of the night, I'm going to miss this yeah, thing. Exactly. <laughs> I was just up working. So, uh, um, it, like, how how is the process of like a collaborative book together? Because I know it can be really really tough for some people. So, like, well, how did you, like how was it? Like, how did you make it work? So you, made, you got the book done, so you made it work somehow. 10 years, George. It took <laughs> sure. 10 years. I'm not kidding. It took 10 years. I no. mean, it really did. I mean, we didn't know we the were writing a book. That was like the lady in the end of Titanic. <laughs> exactly. It's been 87 years like that. that it's that been meme. 87 years, George. Right. I'm, George you know, 
Yeah, it's uh, it, it took a long time. I mean, uh, and and Ryan and I, we are first and foremost just really good friends. We admire the heck out of each other's work. We're both in theater. He's a profession. He was a professional actor for a number really? of years. Oh yeah, and he's freaking wonderful. I mean, he's the AP over at Oban. I was saying at Oyster Bay, East Norwich uh, High School. Before that, he was the English department chair. Before that, he was an English teacher, and he was one of those English teachers where the kids were like, "Oh, I got Mr. O'Hara. He's like the best." And I'm like, "You, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna love it." And, and we just, you know, we just connected. So the collaborative process wasn't always easy. I mean, sometimes we really, uh, we dug in, you know, we, we, we had a couple, we had a couple, uh, uh, scrums to, to get to some stuff, but at the same time, I think we both were practicing what we were preaching and we were really trying to do that. We wanted, to, here's the thing. Um, he's an administrator. I'm a teacher. And we're like, who's written a book from a working administrator and a working teacher's position right. where it's, it's basically like a dialectic and, you know, we were thinking about like Augustine. We were thinking about like C.S. Lewis. We were like looking right. at these old sacred texts that are about conversations. And we're yeah. like, let's just go there, man. So it's not a book that is a conversation, but uh, people who know us can pick out who wrote which which uh, which chapters. Right. And right. that's what it was. We divided it up, man. It's 21 short essays. Each one, like I said, you can read in like four to like seven minutes. And he wrote one, I wrote one, and then we helped each other do it. And it was it turned out to be freaking great, man. Like we became better friends writing it. Did you, did you ever get to a point where your perspective as a teacher, you were like, I don't agree with what you just said. Like, yes. <laughs> okay, so do you have, do you have an example of that? Like, is there one that sticks out to you? Sure. And, like, and what happened? Like, did something, did something change in the text or, or was he like, I don't really care. Uh, well, so <laughs> it's great. Well, I mean, we're both really strong, uh, right. willed and, yeah. and, and, and he's even funnier than I am. You know what I mean? And I think I'm kind of no. a funny dude. Oh yeah, no, no. He's, he's got the, he's got the juice. You'll meet him and you, you're, you're going to be like, this guy's great. You're like, this, this guy's the guy I want to talk to. Um, group text. <laughs> exactly. Let's do it. Um, you know, so there's, there's three big columns in the book, natural accountability, contexting and conspiracy. And, and what that all boils down to is like natural accountability is like pe telling people other what to do, other people what to do doesn't work. Everybody's right. accountable to themselves. What you have to do is figure out what people are into and then help right. them do the thing. And the conspiracy piece is like, get to know people. Like if you don't know the names of the children, the people who work with you or for you, like you're not doing your job. You need to know right. what they're into, know what sports are into the music. Do you listen to Biggie? If you don't listen to Biggie, you should listen to this. And right. then contexting, which is like, figure out how people need to hear things. Cause what you say is less important than what other people hear. And, and when Ryan and I were really chipping away at this, yeah, it's dope, dude. This book is sick, man. I'm telling you, everybody who reads this book says to me, everybody needs to read this book. I feel so comfortable uh -huh. about saying that. And, and one of the battles that Ryan had, Ryan and I had early on was about natural accountability. He came up with this cool idea and probably it bugged me because he came up with it. And, and I'm, I'm going to be honest. I, I'm not happy admitting this, you know, Ryan and I haven't talked about this, so he's going to listen to this and be like, I knew it. Um, but he came up with this idea that he called fire. And his idea was this. Everybody's driven by their fears, their interests, their responsibilities, Ooh, and their experiences. Uh, I like yeah, that. I know. Exactly. In fact, it was almost too cute. That was part of the fight. I'm like, dude, it's too cute. I hate cute. I don't want to be adorable. I don't want people to be like, oh my gosh, fire. I'm like, I hate that. I hate when people go like, I love a good, I hate acronyms. Like, I'm You know what I would have done? I would have said, no, I think we should say everyone's with rife. Dude, you just took it out of my mouth. That is exactly what happened. I'm like, no, should be rife. no dude, I'm not kidding you. I also was like, right, how about fry? We all be fried. Anyway, um, the, the point is you got me really it's fired crazy. up there because you really just landed it. That is actually actually what happened. You're so, but <laughs> I love it. It is. So, I, I mean, that was a battle because there was a part of me, I think, uh, I hate to admit it, but I didn't want that idea to be his. And, and I, I'm saying that because, you yeah. know, I, I love him, but, you know, collaboration. I mean, we're theater people. You know, you, you were talking about competition. I'm a very competitive person. He's a very competitive person. We love each other, but we mm -hmm. we bust right. on each other about running. We like, you know, how, right. how, how far do you run? Like Ryan's running right now in the morning. I'm like kind of mad at him. I'm like, you're getting up at four in the morning to run, you jerk. You know, that's that's so. So that's uh, that, that that is one of the pieces that we argued over. I love it. Hey, there's actually you're talking this. Uh, you're going to love this quote It's from Phil Jackson, who's the best yes. coach terrible right. gm right terrible gm amazing coach new amazing coach. new players and nothing else like right. new players better than anybody like a player yeah. whisperer yeah. yeah so he so kind of connecting to your idea what what was the term you used then was it the not the fire one the other one about uh a contexting conspiracy no uh, you're talking uh, about like getting people like baseball maybe it was the fire thing 
Yeah, lay it on me. Yeah. He, he said this. One thing I've learned as a coach is that you can't force your will on people. If you want them to act differently, you need them to inspire. To, you need to inspire them to change themselves. Natural There's, accountability versus artificial accountability. That's it, right there. Right. And that, so, like at the end of the day, when you when you force your will on people, they might actually do the thing they do. And sometimes it's because you're the boss, because blah blah blah. But they're going to resent you. It's going to come back to haunt you. And I think that's where a lot of people get lost in that too. Is that yeah, they might do it. But it doesn't help. And I think that's one of the things I've been kind of talking about with education with kids is if you actually get a kid so dependent upon the teacher uh, to learn and they're like coerced through carrots and sticks, right? Like I'm doing this for grades. I'm doing this for blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. What happens when the kid leaves? And mm -hmm. you will, the impact of a teacher, the true impact, you will, you, that's the thing that I always have struggled with measurements uh, and accountability measures that we use in education is because if you really know if a school or a teacher is effective, it's what the kid does after they're in school, not in school. Right. Preach. preach. Right? And so I think, I think that's a, that's a kind of a ties beautifully. So if you can go back and edit it, I would just throw that quote in there. Right. I don't know if you can go back. It's perfect. It's perfect. Maybe have it in there too. Katie Novak and I was actually funny. Cause you said 10 years, Katie Novak and I wrote innovates of the box in like, I think two weeks. And she, I basically would write in the morning. Are you flexing on me right now? Is that what no, you're doing? it was like, it's just, it's just how I cannot. So when, when I'm in the process of writing a book, it's all I can think about to the point where I get sick. Like I mm. like, like I dream about it. So I'm like, I cannot live like this. Right. Cause it's just like in my head. So like, I'll like, kind of like think like, yeah, I want to write a book. But, and, but once I commit, it's like, that's it. So I've like I've written uh, three books and not one of them have I ever is the last have I actually written for over three weeks. But I write all the time too, right? Yeah. But I would write in the morning, and then she'd look at what I wrote, and then she would just put her part in the second, and then we just we just had a nice schedule together. It was like not that's just when she worked and that's when I worked. But it was like interesting because of how different that process is, um, and we didn't we didn't know each other the same way that you in. Uh, you know, but we actually, it's funny because she's like my annoying sister now. <laughs> she's awesome, by the right. way, as you know, she's awesome. Well, do I'm you know a, why she's awesome? Because I'm a fan. I'll say she's my annoying sister and she'd be like, I am. And she just embraces <laughs> that. It was just why I love her, right? So I, I love cool. when people know themselves. It's so great. Yeah, she's she's awesome. But I'd, I'd never, I'd only say that publicly. I would never tell her to her face. So, you know, you know how it is. Okay, so. Give us like one, what, what is your biggest, if someone's reading this book, what is like the biggest takeaway? The biggest but, takeaway. But yeah. not, don't give them too much. So that yeah, they have to buy it. I, I got it. The biggest takeaway is that, uh, the, the, the myth that you're in control and that right. you're in charge and the bigger your title is, the more that you have power over it, it will, uh, it will actually sap your, your, your power. The, right. the greatest power is not working on people. It's working through them. And I'm not trying to be cute. I know that that's polished, but in, in all fields, in all leadership, but especially in education and leading at school is different. It's not like working in the corporate world. We do a lot of comparisons to the corporate world, do a lot of comparisons to the mm -hmm. military space, to athletics. And we should, we have things to learn from yeah. all these spaces, yeah. but education is different, man. You can't, it's very hard to fire teachers. You can't fire students. You can't fire parents. Right. You know, we have got to work with what we got and the power comes from going like, all right, sometimes I can't choose much of my team. Watch me work. I can play with any team you throw at me. I'm a great coach. I don't coach just the good players. I help every player get better. I really believe that, right. George. Well, hey, okay. Going back to Phil Jackson, there's two things I want to bring up. First of all, Phil Jackson, the beauty of him as a coach was he made sure every player on that team knew they were contributing to the success of that team. It wasn't like this is all about Michael Jordan, right? Absolutely. And the thing that actually, if you watch The Last Dance, if you know anything about the Bulls history. Beautiful film. What – my favorite documentary of all time. It Beautiful. Is so, good. So, good. So, so good. So if you, if you watch that, the shift for Michael Jordan becoming Michael Jordan was when they started winning championships and when it became not about him, but it became like, he became like, it was about the team and that's what shifted. Right. And that's the thing. The second thing I want to bring up, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. And I, I know that you, um, there's a certain amount we can talk about with this because you're still working in a school district and things like that. And I'm not saying this, I know your school district. I know Chris, 
um, some of your, your leaders too. So sure. I think it's just kind of like our, our general observations of education. When you're talking about this, about leadership, I feel right now the, 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 the maybe the disconnect, the dissatisfaction, the, the unsatisfying nature for many educators mm -hmm. is because people are squeezing them to try to control everything and it's actually making things worse mm -hmm. like is that fair is that or am i off like because i i feel it's like becoming so micro and and it's it's politicians over school districts it's school districts or you know school boards over their superintendent it's like it feels like everyone's trying to just take control of everyone else's actions, which is actually causing more of the issue. That's is that it, man. You got, no, I mean, you have it spot on. And I mean, you're hitting everything that, that we write about. I mean, we, we talk about Lee Shulman, who you probably know out of Stanford, superstar out of Stanford, who, who, who basically talked about autonomy and obligation. And, 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 and it's like, we're in a case study right now where people are trying to tighten the screws and, and also at the same time, pretend that they are caring for people Right. Push comes to shove. No one's caring for anybody. So, you know, Shulman says, you know, you can't mandate what teachers do. It's, it's too complex. Yeah. Man mandates mess it up. What you need to do is you need to support them. You need to give them lanes and then you need to help them when they bump out of it. And sometimes you need to say like, sit down, man, I got you. You know, there's nothing more powerful than an admin saying like, can I cover your class? The teacher might say no. In fact, the teacher will almost always say no because teachers hate missing their own class. But then the teacher goes like, I'm cared for. And that brings me to my girl, Nell Noddings, who, who is like the G. About, 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 thank you for that, man. That's, wow, so awesome. the that, man. That's, the, that's the first time anybody's probably ever done that huge blast out for Noddings. But man, she deserves it. And she wrote about caring. And like, man, listen, I know it sounds simple. You're a yeah. father. Anybody who thinks about little kids, it's very easy to connect with this. But when they think about adults, they forget. People need to feel cared for. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, teachers are feeling uncared for. Are some teachers maybe saying crazy things on social media? Are they maybe like poking people in the eye? Are teachers sitting back? Are there some teachers, is there a small percentage of teachers who are laying back and maybe making everybody look bad? Absolutely. In right. every field, by the way, there are terrible shortstops. There right. are terrible point guards. That doesn't mean if you make it in the NBA, you're bad. There are great teachers who are trying to get through and they don't feel cared for. And that's the big thing I want to say. We have to show care and we're not good at it, man. We think care means, you know, we're going to throw you some crumb cake at the end of the day. Um, care. We think care means we're going to give you a little note. Care means like, I'm going to listen to you complain and then I'm not going to fight back with you, but I'll show up tomorrow and then I'll say, I heard you complain yesterday. How can I help you work today? Now that we did the complaint, caring means you know what? I know you need another day. I'm going to give it to you. And then when you come back, I'm going to be right by your side. Caring means you matter and what you're going through matters to me. Right. I can't fix everything, but I can tell you, I see you. And I think you're an important person. That's not happening enough, man. That's what I think. So two things I want to throw in there. Two, yeah. The first one is uh, we spend so many, so much time on people that are causing 10% of issues, right? Amen. Amen. And then you have, then you have your superstars who feel uh, underappreciated. And a lot of times they actually feel like, Hey, I kind of want to grow too. And that's what's actually made them really great is that they're craving mentorship. And then we're like, Oh no, 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 they're good. Right. right. And then we just leave them, set them and forget it. Right. And then, and so that you, so a lot of times, you know, our best teachers, our best staff, and like you said, in all professions, they're just like, Oh, they're good. Let's just deal with the issues. Right. And yeah. so I think sometimes, um, this is the other, this is the other, maybe, I don't know if it's the dark side of admin and I don't really talk about this cause I don't blog about it, but I think it's actually something that is, is important is that sometimes the most caring thing I would do as an administrator is say to a teacher, like, I don't think this is for you. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that you are not happy here. I don't think you like teaching. I don't think you like this. And I could not say something and then you spend 30 years of your life doing this and you hate it drudgery you're miserable or I can say something now. Right. And yeah. I, I have never, and that conversation was very, like, it's not like I've had that, you know, like every other day, mm -hmm. I've had, but I have never ever had that conversation with someone where they 
didn't actually agree with me and thank me for like basically acknowledging it because I think sometimes we just let people. And so for me sometimes, and it wasn't like, I, I believe this too. I don't like the people that I'm talking about. were not like hated kids mm-hmm. who are just like wanting to sabotage school. It just wasn't for them. Right. And, and for me to just say like, Hey, you're like a, like I, like I actually could say like, I think you're a really good person. I think you're like a very wonderful person, but I also don't, think this is necessary for you. Right. And some, and sometimes it was, sometimes I had to have that conversation saying, I don't think this class, this grade level is for you. Sometimes I think, Hey, you know what? I don't know if kids are your thing, but I think the way you design curriculum is amazing. And I think this might be a better fit for you. And I think that actually came. And I think a lot of times people see it as like, Oh, what an evil admin doing this. Whereas Mm -hmm. I, I actually saw like me actually, caring enough for that person to say like, Hey, I, I don't, I don't want you to spend 30 years of your life doing something you despise. Cause this is like teaching is hard enough. If you love it. Oh man, you got right? that right. Yeah. Right. And then if you hate it, good luck. Spot on. You sound just like my, uh, my teacher at the college of St. Rose. I'm taking an administrative program yeah. right now and I got a killer teacher. She's a, a big superintendent in New York city school. She's helping with the mayor is, transition. Is her, her name is Dr. Mari de Gavaya. <laughs> Yo, she's yeah, no joke. Host. Yeah, seriously, she's no joke. I had, I've, dude, I had one class with her that went seven yeah. hours, and I'm not kidding you. I was like leaning in the whole time. I thought I was gonna be in jail. It's totally different. It was one of those things where I'm like, right. I can't wait for the next class. And That's one awesome. of the things she said is, she's like, you gotta figure out how to place people. And yep. and here's the thing, education is big. You know, mm-hmm. some people should not be in a classroom. You know, mm-hmm. and and the capacity to be able to identify where a person belongs. Yep. It can look cruel, it can look cold, but actually it can be the most kind thing you sure. can do. Sure. And, you know, and, and Ryan puts it this way in our book. He's like, listen, if you need to let somebody go, he's speaking like a true administrator. He's like, if you got to let somebody go, if you need to push somebody out or put them in a new space, it's so much easier if you build a relationship with them so that they're not like, this is personal or this person's coming right. after me. You've connected with them over the time so that when you right. say to them, you know, I don't think this is right for you. It's just what you just said. And George, you proved that's what you do, or at least that's what you did when you were running it. Yeah. It's like, they, they go like, you know what, actually, thank you. Thank, yeah. you, like, thank you for releasing me because I was chained to a rock and I didn't, I was, I had right. no capacity to even identify that. Yeah. All right. Okay, man. So we proved that we can talk about some of the negative stuff too. And right. And finding solutions, right? Have like, to have to, yeah. it's not real if you don't. It's All not right, real if you don't. So this is going to be the last question. We were like way over time already. Oh, it's awesome. To just talking to me. And so like, Hey, everyone, I highly suggest pick up Ryan and Mike's Dr. Ryan's book. Right? <laughs> make God, sure. God bless. Right. Okay. Yeah. So Outside of education, you and I connected. We talked about um, music we love. You are you a big movie guy? Yeah, I'm a huge movie guy. I teach a okay. movie, I teach a movie class a, in my school. Do you have a movie it. that you associate with the pandemic? Like, it's not like I'm not talking. Uh, what's that? Contagion. That's not what I mean. I mean like right. the blur. Like, if you go 20 years from now and you watch the mo- this movie, you be like, oh, I remember watching that movie during the, that blur time. Is there one for you? So the movie Lost in Translation. Um, oh, really? I watched it probably at the very beginning of the the pandemic. I didn't know. Remember back in the well, yeah. Nobody remembers, but at the beginning we were all like, "This is gonna be three weeks," you know. And I was like, "Oh, it's gonna be four weeks," you know. That's gonna be five, you know, whatever. Um, I'm a big Bill Murray fan. I'm deep yeah. on Bill Murray. In fact, when you go to otherful.com, when you go to the place where it says like buy our book, there's literally a button that just says Bill Murray and it takes you to an interview with him where he's talking about being present because I, 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 I freaking love, I love this it. guy. Anyway, um, I read, I watched Lost in Translation and it, I'd seen it before, but there was something about the timelessness. There was something about all that space. Tokyo looks so beautiful. I've never been to Tokyo. Yeah. I can't wait to go. Uh, my, my, my wife lived in Japan for, for some time when she was in high school and, and, and studied Japanese. So like, I, we can't wait to go when this thing's over, but I, I just seeing it and the music, the music, the, the soundtrack of that movie is so cool. What happens in it? Who even knows what happens in it? He drinks scotch. He talks to Scarlett Johansson. They right. have like a crazy time. Nothing. That was, her big, that was her big breakthrough role, right? 
Yes. And everybody fell in love with her because she's just undeniable and she's so captivating. But in the meantime, I think about kind of the timelessness and the lost space of that. And, you know, it also reminds me, maybe I drank a bit of scotch during the pandemic. Maybe I didn't. Right. And, right. uh, and so that's, that's what I think of. I think of that beautiful movie. How about you, man? What's your, what's your, pan, what's your Pando movie? Mine's, mine's terrible now. <laughs> Come on. No, like I, mine's, mine's Eurovision with Will uh. Ferrell. Dude, come on, it? it's an awesome. Yes, of course, dude. It's so good. It's so it's, good. Right? It's so brilliant. And it's overlooked <laughs> because it gets to the bottom of the barrel of Will Will Ferrell movies, but it's actually so it totally stands, man. It's good. It is so good. The music in it is so good. It's actually it's so because I'm a big soundtrack guy, right? Like I can fall uh Garden State, one of my favorite movies because of the soundtrack, right? Same. I actually hey, I actually yesterday. Do you like do you ever go on your like I've like really into my like Facebook, like look back. Same here, man. It's so weird. It's because it's because of our age, right? It takes you back in time, man. It's wild. You know what? So this is what I said. I wonder. So I said, gardens. This was my, you know, it was like George is right. Like it's like, though it was those ones. Though I missed those so bad. Me too. It was real. It was cool. It was fun. So, uh, it was like, uh, I said this, I'm actually, and I'm like, Ooh, does, do I, do I agree with 13 years ago, George? I said, garden state is the best movie soundtrack. Sorry, purple rain. Oh, <laughs> okay. I mean, calling out purple rain is tough, but, and I'm a deep but, Prince fan. So I'm just going to say that, but garden state is really, really good. Dude. That soundtrack is nuts. It introduced so many good. great, the right. shins, oh, yeah. iron and wine. Yeah. You think about like, these bands Coldplay, Coldplay oh, Coldplay. Was, like they it was not like Coldplay like concert Coldplay it was like kind of like back, indie back when, like right back when and they were an art, back that, when they were an art band and they were saying he, stuff uh Zach what's his name Zach Braff, Braff, Zach he used um a Coldplay song in the movie after Garden, what do you remember that movie it's like I, I know so he used it um uh and he used a Coldplay song when he's like waiting for his girlfriend at the door and right. she like locks him out. Right. And I can't remember the song, but it just like, it was Riveting. so well used. Mm -hmm. I just love it. But yeah, like <laughs> I, my answer sucks. No, it You're doesn't. No, 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 no. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Ding dong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ding dong. Yeah. Yeah. Ding dong. Um, Actually, the, uh... I got, I got to tell you this real quick. You know, okay. It's the movie there from Iceland, right? Yeah. So I had a meeting with someone about doing a, an event with a, a virtual event, but it's out of Iceland. And I want to go to we, Iceland, man. Right. So, well, so, so he's like, Hey, uh, you know, he said his name. I'm like, Hey, before we even get anything, have you seen your over? So <laughs> first thing I'm like, I, I said, I know. Cause like, Hey, I know you're from Iceland. I'm just curious if you see it. Like, cause if you, if you ask me if I saw my big fat Greek wedding, of course I've seen it and I know it all in out and we don't use Windex on everything. That's, you know, <laughs> it's not true. Right. But it's like, you kind of associate it. Right. Cause of like, you know, cultural heritage stuff like that. And he, so do you remember the guy who would say more? Yeah. Yeah. Ding dong. Do you remember that? And he yeah. like freak out. Yeah. yeah it's so this guy said, yeah. Do you know the guy who yelled? Yeah. Yeah. Ding dong lived in my apartment building. I'm like, get out of here. Like actually, this that actor lived in his apartment building. No way. Yeah. So That's it was true. like, so it was like, kind of like, oh yeah, Iceland is very small. <laughs> you all know each other. Actually, it, yeah, you like actually Canada. do know each other. Right. It's like I always get the like, hey, I know a guy from Canada. Do you know him? Yep, I know him. I just say, what? yeah, I do. Is yeah, we... John. <laughs> yeah, I know John. Yeah, we we uh, we we go and get coffee at uh, what's it called? Importance. Uh, Tim, Tim Hortons, Hortons, thank you. Okay, yeah. last thing I'll say to you: you make fun of Tim Hortons. I I'm went not going to make fun of it. I made, I went to Madison Square Garden oh, for a basketball okay. game, and they have a Tim Hortons. Like there is a Tim Hortons in the greatest arena in the world, Madison Square Garden in New York. I could not believe it. You I know, remember. I remember when it replaced the coffee shop before it. It was a. It was a Dunkin' before it, and then it became it a Tim Hortons. Wow! Just kind of slow, slow takeover of the slow United roll, States. man. Of Canada, that's actually that hurts a little bit that they took over Dunkin' Donuts, Tim Hortons, right? Just kind of Canadian stuff going in there. I'm telling you, man, they're going to close up that Magnolia <laughs> Cupcake place and they're going to turn it into like a maple syrup shop. I mean, we're, RJ, we're RJ Barrett plays the next Canadian. So Whoa. there we go. Slow roll. Oh, you coming. know what? I got to get somebody from the State Department on the phone. That's it. <laughs> right. All right. Okay. All right. Hey, man, it was awesome talking to you. And Great talking hey, to you. I, 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 
highly suggest connecting with Mike. I made him put up his Twitter uh, so that you'd all find him. Check out the book, Otherful. It's linked in the description down below. It was awesome talking to you. And if you're listening to this and you don't feel more energy, I got nothing for you. I got I can't do anything for you after Amen. listening, Mike. So you're the right. best. You're the best, George. Thanks, Thanks baby. Bro. All right. Thanks everyone for listening. Have a wonderful day.